So the result in verse 20, the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And again, that's exactly what he had told them would happen. Because in John 16, verse 20, he had said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. And that's exactly what is taking place now as they're looking at Jesus as he's there before them. And they are now exceedingly joyful and glad because Jesus is with them again. Well, in verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And so once again he begins to minister. And I want you to see this. He gives them once again peace. And he says, this peace that I'm giving to you, but I'm also giving you a commission. Notice in verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. This is a commission. He's sending them out. Jesus received authority, as he mentions that in Matthew chapter 28, when he says, all authority has been given unto me. He says that in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus has authority. And with this authority, he is now commissioning them. Now, every Christian in this room has used or heard the term, the Great Commission. We've all heard that term, and perhaps we've even used it in conversations. When people say to you, why do you take that gospel? Why do you talk about Jesus with people? And and we say, well, we've been commissioned to do that. And what, what are you talking about you've been commissioned? Well, we've been authorized. We've been sent to do that. Where do you find that? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. The Bible tells us to go into the world and make disciples. We're to preach the gospel. And so that's what we do. And so normally people will say, where's that come from? And we say from Matthew. But we can also say that every gospel, including the book of Acts, chapter 1, contains a commissioning. This is John's great commission. But you see the great commissioning in in Mark and in Luke, as well as John and as well as the book of Acts. And, and you see it in Matthew. You see the commission given. And, and in some ways you can take the, the five times that it's given and you can see a sequence in that and to see that Jesus is given different insights and all. And in this particular commissioning here, he's saying, the Father sent me, I also send you. So I have authority that I've received from the Father. But with this authority, I am commissioning you. I am sending you out. What are they to do? Well, I'm sending you out to preach a message. I want you to see this because he says in verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. How's that happen? It comes to the gospel message. It comes to the gospel message. We have a responsibility to take a message called the gospel that is unique because it's the message of salvation. So as a father sent me, I'm sending you. I'm sending you with a commission. The commission is to preach the gospel, the gospel of salvation. Now, in Mark chapter 8, verses 35 through 37, Jesus said it this way. He said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a good question. It was asked 2000 years ago. It's still being asked. What are you willing to give in exchange for your soul? Jewish prophet by the name of Woody Allen read something recently I found interesting. He was questioned why he doesn't believe in God. Anybody who knows Woody Allen knows of his movies and his comedy routines and all. Everybody knows that he's an atheist. Everybody knows that he's he's a Freudian. Uh, in the way that he thinks Freudian psychologists uh, have uh, influenced his way of thinking. That's very obvious in the movies that he's made and all. But he also is, uh, he, he's an atheist, and, and everybody knows that. And uh, though he's an old man now, many of you have never heard of him, but he's very well known in, in my generation. And um, everybody knows he's an atheist, and he was being interviewed about that. And the questioner asked him about his, why he doesn't have a faith in God, or, you know, actually was kind of teasing him, but making reference to the fact that he's known to be an atheist. And and Woody Allen's response, paraphrased, was interesting, at least it was to me, because Woody Allen said, you know, I just have a, uh, I just have a hard time believing. I just, I just can't. I can't get myself to do that. He says, but I must admit 
those who do have a faith in God live a lot happier life than I do. And I thought that was a pretty interesting, honest response. They who, those who do have a, uh, faith in God are happier than me. And, 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 and wait a minute, you have to ask yourself, you're a multimillionaire. You're, you're a man who has so much money that if you were to lose $100,000 in a day, you wouldn't even notice it's gone. He's got so much money that whatever your, your yearly salary is, whatever that may be, should you be working, have a job, whatever your salary is, if, if he lost that in a, in a minute, he wouldn't even notice it because he's got that much money. Because when he produces movies, when he gets them out and everything, he makes millions of dollars. This is a man who's got millions and millions of dollars. This is the man who can go into Beverly Hills, Bel Air, or whatever, wherever he wants. He wouldn't go there. He doesn't like it. He likes New York. So, but he can go into Manhattan, and he can spend $15, $20 million on a penthouse there overlooking the park if he wants to, and it doesn't bother him. He's got the money. He's been doing that for many years. This is a man who's very, very wealthy. Do you think it bothers him when the when, when price of gasoline goes up another dollar a gallon? Do you think he's going, oh, no, what am I going to do? He doesn't even think about that. It's not something he worries about. It's not something that would concern him. He's not worrying about his retirement benefits. He's not worrying about medical. He's not worried about anything. He doesn't worry about any of that. You know, at night when he puts his head on the pillow, he doesn't worry about where his meal's going to come from tomorrow. He doesn't think about the bill collector coming to get him. He doesn't have anything like that. He's not worried about his job. He's not worried about anything. The common things that you concern yourself with, he doesn't have a, uh, an idea of what that's like. It's been so long ago that he even worried about that kind of thing that he doesn't have to think about that at all ever again. He just doesn't have to. And yet he's saying, I'm not happy. And that's what Jesus was speaking about. What does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And so we have this message that we can bring to people. And, and with, with God uh, working, they, they can receive it. And they can actually have something in this message that gives them life. Two things I want to point out. One, notice verse 22, how it says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then secondly, notice verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained them. One, we have a gospel message, but we have to need, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to take that message, to bring a word to people, to hear that they might be convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment so that their hearts might be turned to God. Because until the Holy Spirit is working at that place, you can take that message and you can give it and one person will listen to you and say, I want that. How do I receive that? And the other person may say to you, that's your opinion. You know, you believe that. You believe in Jesus. I don't. I'm a Buddhist. You, you believe that. I don't. I'm a Hindu. You believe that. I don't. I'm a Muslim. You believe that. I don't. I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. Agnostic. Agnostic is a Greek word. When you put the letter A before the Greek word, it means without. A gnosis, agnostic, simply says without knowledge. That's one of those words that people like to use. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of a cool word. You know, I'm agnostic. The Latin is ignoramus. Nobody ever says that. It's just, just throwing that out. Just throwing that out. I don't believe I'm an ignoramus. No. It means without knowledge. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So the same sun that melts an ice cube hardens clay. The same message that melts a person's heart so that they say, that's me, I need Christ. It's the same message that hardens a person to reject him. And so Jesus is speaking about sending us but empowering us. 